All right. Can, can you all hear me in the back? OK, thumbs up. That's a, that's a good sign. So hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, my name is Richard Schneeman, or Schneems on the internet. A little bit about me to get started off. I am actually a mechanical engineer from Georgia Tech, but I've been writing Ruby code for, woo, rambling wreck. Uh, I've been writing Ruby code for about um, five, six years. I really enjoy it. Uh, you might recognize me from such gems as Sextant. If you ever have run rake routes on your console and it like takes freaking forever, it takes like 20 seconds, you can put the uh, Sextant gem into your gem file. And if you have your server running, you can just go to slash localhost 3000 slash rake slash routes and it, and it comes up like that. Um, you'll also be happy to know that this is a feature in Rails 4. It's a different path though. It's like slash, uh, Rails info routes, but you, you can make use of that. Uh, also coded the Wicked gem. It was featured on a um, Rails cast with uh, Mr. Bates, and this is for doing step-by-step -step controllers, so or step-by-step -step actions inside of a controller, and kind of a restful way if you're interested in that. Uh, I also work for Heroku. Maybe you've heard of it's a small little small little company. Does a little bit with uh, with Ruby, a little bit with Rails, um, and I am an adjunct professor at the University of Texas, where I teach Ruby and Rails. So this is actually really good news for anybody who's learning Ruby or Rails, because I have all of my content online, about 40 hours worth of lectures, presentations, quizzes, exercises, all of that, uh, schneems.com slash uh, UT Rails. Uh, so my last name is Schneemann. It's uh, German for snowman, and Schneems is just kind of like abbreviated version of that. So people kind of ask me where Schneems came from. So uh, you know, why, why am I here, and why am I talking about StarCraft? Whoops. Um, so I like I freaking love StarCraft. Uh, I went to um, uh, did a study abroad in China where they have all these like internet cafes in like the days of like StarCraft One and just got like massively addicted to like StarCraft One. And then when StarCraft Two came out, I was like on the beta constantly. Uh, at one point in time, I was like one v one platinum. Uh, like this was like before Diamond League, so like that was kind of like a big deal. And then I realized like I needed to see the light and the sun. Uh, and so I don't play as much anymore, but I'm incredibly excited for, uh, you know, the heart of the swarm. Anybody? Anybody? Pre-orders? Right here? Yeah. All right. We got some, some Zerg, Protoss, Terrans in the crowd. Okay. Um, you'll also be happy to know that I'm presenting with my gaming mouse. This is a, a Razer Naga. It's got the, uh, the, the buttons on the side. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm legit. All right. Uh, so what does StarCraft have to do with scaling, you might ask? Well, uh, it, you know, it's a game of balance and precision. Uh, in, in general, there is no one best strategy. There's no, you know, everybody's like, oh man, you know, Protoss is way better than Terran, or Terran's like way better than Zerg. And, and at the end of the day, it's like incredibly balanced, and there's uh, all of these different ways that you can get faster and you can get better. As you're playing, a lot of it's about the APM, which is, yeah, it's kind of like servers. Like, we're all about requests per minute, right? You know, requests per second, so like APM. Um, but what it really, really comes down to is uh, if you want to get good at a, a video game or really, you know, just anything in general, um, you want to scale your web server, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take time. You're going to have to learn um, all of the different rules and um, apply them in the, in the correct way. So, um, I've recently been turned on to a book by, uh, actually, I don't remember the author's name, but it was recommended to me by Steve Klabnik. Uh, the author of Playing to Win is a, uh, the premier Street Fighter player in the world. Remember, like, Street Fighter Turbo, Super, all those? Like, he, he goes around and plays competitively with Street Fighter. Um, but he's written this book, and it's all about how, how to play to win. Um, and I, I, there's a lot of lessons in here that you can apply to everyday life. It's not necessarily just video games. Um, I like to take, uh, take different lessons from different areas of my life, uh, such as StarCraft, and say, you know, really internalize and say, why is this a good strategy? Is it a good strategy just because of the game mechanics, or um, are there other areas in my life I can apply these? So that's kind of how the, the talk came about. All right, so uh, whenever we're talking about uh, scaling and we're talking about speed, we're really talking about two different things. We're talking about speed and throughput. So um, speed is probably the, um, the most common one that you're, you're going to run into. Um, it's just something going faster than another. You know, we're going to upgrade our zerglings to speedlings. We're going to upgrade our, our banes. Um, 
And then throughput is like literally just how many things can we get through at one time, you know? Like each of these individually doesn't do a lot of damage, but like you fill the whole uh, screen with them and, uh, and, and, and you can go through. So uh, both of these things are really, really important. You can't, really, you can't just focus on one and completely ignore the other. So those are two things we're going to talk about. Uh, we are going to go into two really common patterns for, uh, for getting faster as well as uh, getting more throughput. Uh, we are going to optimize and cache for speed. We, we learned a little bit or heard a little bit about different um, aspects of caching in the keynote. Uh, so with optimization, we are going to just search for slow inside of our program and make it fast. Yeah, sound, sounds super simple, right? Um, at the end of the day, the, like, the one key takeaway is you want to measure everything and use those measurements to, <clears throat> to make really informed decisions about what to do, how, how to go faster, um, and how to, how to get more throughput. Uh, so optimizing, we're just going to make, make it fast, generally. Um, we're going to be do, doing a little bit of min-maxing. So we're going to minimize slow, maximize fast. I promise, it's that easy. Uh, so the, the, the second pattern is going to be caching. We're going to search for expensive operations. You know, maybe we can't make it our, any faster. Maybe we've already added indices. Maybe our request is, is going as fast as it possibly can. Um, we want to not have to incur that cost. <clears throat> so with caching, you're essentially taking something really expensive and making it cheap. Uh, finally, we are going to add uh, capacity to get additional throughput through our servers. And um, this is correlated with speed. If we can serve more requests, if each request takes less individual time, then we can actually get more throughput. But uh, there's a reverse correlation where um, if you don't have enough throughput, that can actually start affecting individual page speed. So OK, that's, that's kind of like the, the introduction to the talk. And now here's the actual talk. Uh, first, we're going to talk about speed. And when I, when I talk about speed, there are two very important things to consider. Um, it's client speed, client side speed. This is uh, you know, what you actually, the client sees. And there's server side. So this is the page load cycle. Uh, and for server side, what we're going to be talking about is this request and this response area. This is uh, what actually happens on your server when a client types in your address. Uh, it, it hits your Ruby server and then it does some processing and comes back. Um, so I like to correlate this to macro. So being really good at macro in, in StarCraft. So you know, hey, here we've got this huge map and like uh, way more minerals than our, our enemy and our opponent. Um, and you know, that's, that's one way that we can, that we can win. Uh, so first we're going to talk about backend speed. And of course, uh, before we do anything, uh, we want to measure it. So, uh, we want to make sure that we're using our server resources fully. For something along the lines of StarCraft, this would kind of correlate to making sure you've got, you know, we want, we want three workers on each set of minerals. Like, you want to keep your money low. You want to really uh, make use of everything that's available to you. So there's a couple of different really common causes of slow inside of apps, uh, especially Rails apps. Um, so, whoop, sorry, gaming mouse. Um, um, I'm a pro, you can tell. Uh, so inefficient usage. Uh, in StarCraft, a lot of people will queue units. They say, oh, look, you know, I can just say, like, I'm going to build five of these. Um, well, as it turns out, like, you're actually wasting um, other resources. You have this, you know, you have money, you have minerals, and each time you click that button, you were dedicating and saying, hey, here's 50 minerals I can no longer spend. So um, instead of doing that, you can, just, you can just throw one up there as you need it. It's, it's harder to do, but it's also will give you um, more capacity. So don't queue web requests. Kind of kind of makes sense. It's a nice little, nice little parallel. Um, so uh, a really, really common cause of slow is the database, or I.O. You're, you're going out to this data store. It's a really expensive uh, SQL query, perhaps. Um, or maybe it's a language. You know, maybe you need to uh, tweak your, your garbage collection. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself, OK, he, you know, here's a bunch of possibilities for, for different problems. But how can I find, uh, how can I actually dig down and, and figure out why is my application slow? Or it might not even be slow, but you just want it to be faster. So what can we do to improve that? Uh, so 
you always want to know more than your opponent. In this case, your opponent is time. Um, that might be a little bit of a stretch. But, um, so I recommend, uh, it, again, measuring in production. And this is going to be very similar to uh, practice like you play. So um, if you, every single time you, you, you go out in, in development or in production, you are, you are measuring and you are saying, hey, these are the things I'm doing, and this is the result, this is the output, then you can actually take those and learn from them. If, uh, if you're interested in getting better at StarCraft, like one of the most valuable things you can do is get a build order tester. So uh, yet another build order tester, or Yabbit, you can actually just search for this inside of the arcade, and you can get this. And um, as you're playing a game against a very sophisticated AI, you know, it, will, it will try to rush you, it will try to do all these things. Um, it will give you metrics, and you say, hey, I want to build this specific build order, and it will tell you like, how close you are to doing that. Um, similarly, you can watch your replays. So after you have, um, you know, after you've played a game, you turn around and you say, okay, well, my enemy won, you know? So, so if you're on a server, uh, time won, it was really slow. Why exactly did that happen? Well, um, we can turn around and there's ways that we can actually reproduce that and figure out why that was. Um, also, and just in game, uh, you want to just, again, know more than your opponent. So you can, you can use live, um, live scouting. So how does that exactly translate to a, a server? How does that translate to scaling? Well, uh, there's a couple of different things that we can do. We can um, look for, say, n plus 1 queries with our logs. So uh, logs are one of your, your biggest resources that you're given for free. Just everybody, everybody has logs. Um, you might write a piece of code that looks something like this. You pull a bunch of products from a database. You're iterating over all of your products. And then you are then pulling out each of the users for those products. So it, you know, if I hadn't highlighted this, then you might just write this and say, oh, OK, well, you know, no big deal. Uh, but then whenever you run it and you're looking at your logs, you're going to say, like, oh. <laughs> You know, it looks like we're, we just like queued up like 100 different SQL queries. Like, that's not that great. Uh, and if you, it's one of those things. If you're looking at those logs, it's, it's like so obvious. It's, so, it's like right there. Um, so this is one of those things we can do. We can just add in eager loading. So yeah, there's just a method includes where you just say, hey, also go ahead and grab all of those users. And then um, if, you are looking, if you're looking at your logs, uh, it's going to look a lot better. Uh, so. At the end of the day, though, you always want to measure. You always want to make sure that if you, if you do change that optimization, um, you want to look at your page request time and say, oh, yes, we did actually decrease the page uh, load time. Because even if your log looks better, it might perform worse. So um, measure, please. Uh, you can also look for queries not using an index with the logs. Use the logs. Uh, if you go into uh, config slash uh, production.rb, you can set an auto-explain threshold. And any, any query that takes longer than whatever you set here, it's going to automatically run explain in, um, on it so that the database is going to tell you how it's going to find that. You know, if you are looking up a user via email and it takes five seconds for some reason, maybe you know, we've got thousands of users in our database, um, it, it's going to it might turn out and say, like, hey, by the way, I am just sequentially scanning for this email. Uh, and that, that would let me know. Um, it's going to show up in the logs. And that would let me know that, OK, well, hey, maybe I should add an index to this. Uh, so that's one really good way that we can know to add in indices to our, um, to our different columns. OK, so um, using logs, is, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It might be a little bit uh, time consuming, might be a little bit, it's like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's like, obviously, I, I look at my logs. Um, highly recommend using a monitoring software if you're, if you're not already. Uh, so this would be something along the lines of New Relic or, um, or Scout. There's, you know, there's a couple of different solutions out there that will give you a couple of different layers of granularity. Um, and you can, you can view these in, uh, in production as well as uh, some of them have the ability to see them in development. Uh, so I kind of think of it like logs and, and these monitoring tools are kind of like watching your replays. So 
it, you're, you know, it's like you see the request come in, and then you see all this uh, database stuff happen, and then, and then you can, you know, you can visual, visualize and say like, oh, you know, that's exactly where the slow part of my request is happening. And um, so if you, were, if you were being diligent and actually turning around and saying, well, you know, why, why did I lose? Why did I lose to time? Um, after, after a while, you'll actually turn around and be able to pick out and say, okay, well, here's a, here's a place where I could optimize. Here's a place where I could cache. Here's a place where I could add an extra index. Okay, so uh, that's just for, uh, for, for tuning your backend, tuning your data store. Another thing that we can do, or that I, that I talked about, is caching expensive queries. Sometimes, maybe you've already got your, your index on there. Uh, maybe you're already doing eager loading. Like, you know, you've, you've already, uh, you're, the request is coming back as fast as it can, but let's say, you know, we're making that request, and it is, it's just expensive. There's nothing we can do about it. It's gonna take 20 seconds every time we call a user dot some expensive query. Uh, if you're not already, use memcache. It's, uh, it's a pretty fantastic uh, data store. It's also really, really easy to use um, with, with Rails. I recommend the, um, the Dolly gem. And uh, you, when you pair memcache with Rails, you get something called rails.cache. And this is nice because it's a consistent interface. Um, so it doesn't matter what type of cache store you use, uh, you will have the same front end of just calling rails.cache. So that same code previously, we could just wrap it in a rails.cache um, block, and here we're calling fetch, which means go out, tell me if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then we're going to run the query and insert it into our cache. So it's, it's like a, a key value store. So here, just the, the string of cache underscore key is, is our key. It's just a key and a store. Notice, though, it will actually run slower the first time. So some people, they hear about memcache, they hear about Rails cache, and they just like put everything in memcache. And, um, but if you're never gonna actually retrieve that value again, you're actually adding additional time onto that, uh, that query because it has to run, and then it has to insert that data into memcache. But if you do uh, need it again the next time, uh, we never actually hit that query, we just, call um, rails.cache.fetch, it says, oh, here's my cache key, guess what? I, you know, it's gonna jump out there, it's going to get that data, it's gonna come back, and it's gonna come back crazy fast. Um, so uh, this is definitely something to look into if you haven't already in your application, or even if you're using uh, memcache, a lot of people will declare a constant for their, for their memcache servers. I recommend using the rails.cache uh, syntax, it's just, it's nice in case you ever wanna, um, wanna swap around to a, a different cache backend. All right, uh, so that is uh, caching. And that's kind of back-end caching. Uh, we can do view caching as well. Uh, Rails has the ability to do a couple of different types. We can do uh, page caching, we can do action caching, but uh, whenever I'm caching something, I like to cache the, the, the smallest discrete unit that I possibly can. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> inside of our views that represents fragment caching. So we are actually saying, all right, we're just gonna cache just this, instead of the whole page, we're gonna cache the sidebar. Or, you know, we're gonna cache, um, th maybe there's a suggest, an area where it says suggested friends, and that's really expensive because it has to hit our database a lot. Um, in, in that scenario, we might be able to use something like uh, view fragment caching. So the, the one problem that people ran into this is they were like, oh yeah, we love this fragment caching, but um, we want, you know, effectively to have the whole page cached. So people would end up uh, putting fragment caches within fragment caches. And then you had to write this really complex logic to say, well, you know, my inner fragment cache expired. I want to expire the outer fragment cache. Um, so it, it was something that uh, came up a, a fair amount. And um, if you've used Basecamp Next, they, they do that quite a bit. And to cope with that problem, they came up with a cache digest gem, which will actually um, take a digest of the inner cache, and if, if that changes, it will propagate outwards and break all of those nested caches. Uh, this is also another feature that's inside of Rails 4. Um, you know, chances are pretty good if it's in Basecamp, it'll be in Rails 4, um, just as a rule of thumb. Uh, but you can use it now if you're using Rails 3 with the cache digest gem. Uh, Okay, so if, if, uh, if, if measuring and looking at our logs is like rule number one, 
Rule number two, like, like huge capital letters rule number two, like avoid premature optimization. Um, you know, this is like especially uh, popular in StarCraft. Like people come in and they're like, oh, you know, I'm gonna just like, I'm gonna build like 10 bases and like in three hours I'm gonna have so many more minerals, like I'm gonna just crush the enemy and like they're gonna just be like crying. And then they send in like three Zerglings and like destroy all your workers and you're like, what happened? I don't know, you know. People are like, hey, I'm gonna need it eventually, like why not just build it now? Uh, so, yeah, you're not going to need it. Um, or uh, if you follow Bob Martin, he is this, I don't even know how to say that, but you're not going to need it. Uh, so, yeah, um, in general, just build it. Build what you want to build and then come back and measure. Once you, once you have measured, then you can make incremental improvements. Yeah, sure, there are some major architectural things. Um, and generally, if you're smarter, like you're pro it's probably going to be faster the first time you build it. But if you spend way too much time optimizing, you might optimize for the wrong problem. You don't even know what the problem is. You don't know how your users are going to use it. Uh, so if, um, if you've ever heard of uh, Fun Day Mondays, anybody who watches Day 9, uh, so this is a guy who does StarCraft uh, screencasting. He advocates every Monday. He throws out a different challenge out there. He's like, OK, you, know, you have to declare one unit at the beginning of your game and you can only use that unit. And it's just like, you know, people like try to survive, or he's like, oh, you know, you, you, can't, um, you can't take any gas until you have like three bases or something. So people have to, you know, do these crazy, crazy like, like workarounds. And it's kind of a, a way to get you to think outside of the box. But uh, I like that it just happens every single Monday. So uh, why not have like a fast day Friday where everybody, you know, if, if speed is really something that's actually valuable to your company, um, then you can turn around and say, hey guys, every Friday, like, let's just, let's see who can increase our speed the most. Um, where, you know, Friday, like, you don't want to make big pushes, like, you don't want to break your web server accidentally and, like, have to stay really late. So, like, it, you know, it just, it just works out, it works out well. Um, so that's, that's something to consider, maybe, if you're like, okay, hey, how do we actually apply some of these changes? All right, so that's, um, that's speed. Next, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, throughput. I just love, like, so many Bane links. All right. Uh, yeah, just Google so, so, so many Bane links. There's a, yeah, great announcer, uh, some remixes. OK, so if you have a really popular service, I might consider Wikipedia a really popular service, uh, you are going to have compound rights or potentially compounding traffic. Um, luckily, Wikipedia is one of the few places that will actually give their traffic numbers, which is, which is really cool. I got these in 2011, so they probably re released some even more updated numbers. So these are the compound writes, um, and these are the compound edits. So as your service gets more and more popular, you will only get more and more writes. You will only get more and more reads. So if you have a problem with um, a slow web service, if you have a problem with, uh, with throughput, it's only going to get worse. Um, so this is, this is all something to consider. So um, if we're going to be dealing with throughput, then we are going to be um, adding, adding additional capacity. One area that we can really help with this is to split up our web, our workers, and our data store. So let me, let me just kind of define some of those if you're unfamiliar. Um, the web is going to be what actually runs whoop, mouse. Uh, is going to be what um, handles your web requests. So as somebody comes to your website, it's going to say, I want the index page. And your server is going to process and actually turn around and, uh, and deliver that. Uh, you can run your data stores separately. So we run Postgres in, on, a, on a different server, um, Memcache on a different server, whatever you're using, React, Mongo, uh, you know, anything. I highly recommend Postgres if you haven't already checked it out. Uh, and, and this allows us, if because we don't know how people are going to use our application, we don't know exactly how it's going to perform in the real world, if we end up being really data um, intensive, a lot of people end up using our data store, uh, we might want to scale that independently of our web. So uh, you might want to say, OK, we want to add some extra RAM. We want to add some additional capacity. And if they're all on the same box, it's a lot harder to actually measure and figure out where that's coming from and apply the uh, appropriate uh, measures to fix that. Another thing is workers. So workers are going to handle non-request processing. So these are going to be um, anything that, that isn't in the, um, that request response cycle. So uh, the most common thing would be using a tool such as like Rescue, where you will say, OK, you know, I sign up for the service, and 
um, I'm going to get an email eventually that says, hey, thank, you know, thanks for signing up for example.com. Like, we really appreciate to have you. But uh, I might be using a third party mailer, and maybe they're just really busy all of a sudden, and it's going to take half a second for like, me to call out to their, um, their SMTP servers and like, for all of that to process. And like, I, as the user, probably am not, I don't care whether or not I get the email before the request finishes. I actually would probably prefer not to get the email before the request processes. So we can take that task, we can throw it into the background and just say, hey, worker, whenever you get a chance, send out this email. And it allows the request to keep going. So we're not going to be blocking our request. This is also part of Rails 4, uh, the, the, the active queue. Um, this is something that they're kind of encouraging a little bit more. And uh, they're giving a consistent interface to use the queue, kind of like we had Rails.cache as an interface to use the, uh, the cache. So OK, we split out our web, our workers, and your data store. Uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty good start. But what happens when you run out of capacity? Uh, so the uh, first answer, the traditional answer, would be to scale up. This is originally saying, all right, we've got something kind of weak, something, you know, eh, it, it, can, it, can, it can deal, it can handle the job, but we want something bigger, we want something better. Um, the other option is to scale out. So, you know, maybe, maybe we've got one, we can get four, we can get six. Like, we're, we're going to parallelize. Uh, in general, uh, scaling up is considered, it's pretty easy, you know, to, to say, like, all right, we're going to just add a couple, we're going to go to a bigger server, we're going to get some more cores, we're going to get some more RAM, all, all that jazz. Um, and similarly, in StarCraft, like, you can upgrade your units, but at some point in time, you are going to hit a, hit a wall. You can only be at level three on your ground attack. You can only, like, go and build Thors. Like, there's nothing above, like, a Thor. And, you know, maybe that's not even appropriate in, in your case. Um, so uh, uh, scaling out is generally harder, is, is considered harder, but it is unlimited. unlimited. And that's kind of where the StarCraft analogy breaks down, because you are actually limited on your, the amount of guys you can have at 200. But just pretend you can just go on and on. In server land, we can have unlimited servers as many servers as there are in the world, theoretically. Um, so one thing to actually help out with this is an ephemeral web machine. And this is a really, really fancy way of saying that we're not going to store state on our server. Um, if, a, if a web request comes in and um, uh, you, know, you can say, all right, if I'm going to upload, upload a photo and I've got four machines, if I upload a photo onto machine number one, on the first request, and then I come and hit uh, machine number two on the second request, well, my photo is not going to be there. So that, that's just generally bad. Um, so by maintaining a ephemeral nature of your machine, you can actually help to scale out a little bit easier. On Heroku, this would look something like this. You can say uh, Heroku PS scale, and then you just specify, hey, how big do I want it to be? Like, I want you know, six times the capacity. Eh, it's, you know, like just like more instances, more power. Um, it, and like you, now you're going to be able to, um, in our case, handle more requests at, or in StarCraft, like produce more units. That's also like a huge rookie mistake is like people get like late game, they survive, but then they just don't have enough, um, enough back end power to produce. Like they have all of this money and like no way to spend it. Um, so yeah, in uh, Amazon Web Services, it would look something kind of like this. You provision another machine. You use a Chef or something to install all of, you, all of your dependencies. Uh, you connect it to a load balancer, like you push your code up, and then you get it to run, and then like you know you can just do that repeatedly. So that's kind of the equivalent of that like one Heroku command. You can maybe tell which I prefer, perhaps. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to be and in in this scenario, we're only copying code to machines. We're not copying state. Um, we want to never, ever, ever store state on the server. And some, like, when, I, when I tell this to anybody in the Ruby community, they're like, well, obviously. You know, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to store it in the database. I'm going to store it in like, uh, the session. I'm going to store it in S3. Um, if, you, if you know some programmers in like, maybe some statically typed languages, they haven't learned this lesson yet. They're all running on like, huge, like, you know, huge, huge, like, liquid, cooled, like, you know, massive boxes. Um, and, and storing the session state to disk on that box. So if you come to another machine, it's like it looks like you're not even logged in. So um, this is a lesson that a lot of us, uh, or you might not even 
uh, you might not have even thought of this before, but this is why a lot of our tools prefer like S3 or, or memcache, uh, this, type, this type of a thing. Okay, um, so one, we've got that out of the way. Uh, how, do we, how do we store, uh, scale our data storage? Uh, there's two really common patterns. The first one is gonna be master-slave architecture where we are going to do all of our writes onto one, um, one master server and then we can just copy those writes to a bunch of other servers and if we have a read intensive application, we can scale out those reads. And this is another reason why I say please um, measure. Uh, or we can shard our data. So we can turn around and say, all right, it makes sense to actually split up different data onto different machines. Uh, one, one thing I've really seen that's that's popular or common or our software as a service applications where each different, um, different client might get a different database or might get a different table in a different database. So that's, that's really common. Um, and whereas uh, master-slave architecture won't help you out with writes, sharding will. Uh, so, or you could, you could even pair the two of them together. Um, Heroku has uh, two different features called uh, forks and follow, followers. So um, you can just say, hey, like follow my main database. And then now you have a secondary database you could either use uh, for like a high, availab high availability type situation where your original database goes down, or you can use it for fast changeovers, or you can use it for additional read capacity. So that's something to check out. Uh, the big caveat of this is you can't join um, sharded data. So, um, you know, if you have users on two different servers in, in USA and in Europe, you can't join those two tables. You would have to come up with a kind of a, 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 a some sort of a wrapper library or a wrapper service that would do that for you, um, which then it's kind of expensive and it takes a long time. But um, so like Facebook shards MySQL, they have like huge, huge, huge data servers, uh, you know, these clusters of just running MySQL. Um, Instagram, a little bit more recently, um, is shards PostgreSQL. It's, it's fun because they're now the same company. Um, uh, and I think Postgres is better than MySQL, just personally. Uh, if you're interested in data stores, you're interested in some of these different ways we can kind of scale out, or maybe you, you don't want to use a relational data store, or you want to know what your different options are, uh, then Seven Databases in Seven Weeks is a really good book. Um, and it, it, it covered, like the dat first database it covers is Postgres and a couple of the different features and talks about how Postgres is actually getting uh, some of the NoSQL, the really popular NoSQL features. So like HStore is now in Rails 4 uh, and it allows you to make a, a key value column type um, as additional to arrays are, are native um, to Postgres and also you can use those natively in Rails 4. So those are two supported features in Rails 4. Um, and uh, it's been a long time since I said anything about StarCraft, so watch day nine. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the back end side of things. Um, let's talk a little bit about the client side. So we've got our request, we got our response, but you know, this other side, does it, does it really matter? Like once we kick it over to the client, um, well, a, a, as it turns out, it really does. Um, I like to think of this, or client side, or client side speed in terms of like micro. So once you have this massive army and you send them in, um, it, it does matter what you, what you do with it. And there are some different ways that we can kind of optimize these. Um, so in general, um, loading assets is slow. So we've got our JavaScript, we've got our CSS, we've got all of these different, uh, different things. Um, we can do some optimizations to make it faster. So we can decrease the size, we can gzip them, uh, we can uh, put them on a CDN, which uh, I'm gonna get to in just kind of a, a split second. So the, just a, a casual reminder, we're talking about speed. So speed is equal to distance divided by time. Seems, seems pretty reasonable. I think that's, we can all agree that's true. Uh, so distance does matter. If you have a really slow unit and you're trying to send it further, it's gonna take a longer amount of time, therefore decreasing the speed um, of, the, of the whole journey. So a shorter distance actually correlates to a, a faster request um, in, inside of StarCraft. Like you might hear of terms like map control or maybe you'll hear of things like unit position and be like, okay, well, you know, what does that actually mean? How does that, how, what does that correlate to? Um, so if you have a really expensive unit that is really, really super slow, if there's some way, like, man, I really, really want to shoot these SCVs, but like I'm all the way across the map. If only I could be right there. Um, so, you know, location does matter. And we want to be closer to where you need to be. Uh, this is going to correlate to your, 
your application by your server is not going to be next door to the client or to the person who wants, wants those requests. Um, and they can, those different clients are going to be all, you know, potentially, hopefully, all over the world. So the further that that request has to go, the longer it's going to take. Um, so, you know, like what if we could be next door? What if we could have a, a, a server right next to each one of our clients? So that's not really 100% feasible, um, but we can use a CDN. So a CDN stands for a Content Distribution Network. And uh, it's going to look a little something like this, where you do have your, your primary server, but then you also have these other servers kind of spaced around the world where you, once uh, the, the main HTML is delivered from your app, all of the assets can be loaded from the CDN. So those requests can, be, can go to the CDN rather than having to go all the way to your server. So we're actually decreasing the distance, making it faster. Faster is better. Uh, so there's going to serve like um, images, CSS, JavaScript. Um, I, I think of it kind of like as a warp prism for your servers. Like it's like you know the the resources you want right where you need them. Uh, there's two really popular services. We've got um, Akamai. We've got CloudFront. Uh, in order to use a CDN, this is all you need. You set uh, config.actioncontroller.assetshost to a um, URL. Here we're using um, config variables or environment variables. If you are unfamiliar with this, uh, this technique, grab me afterwards. I'll be happy to talk you through why we would want to do that. It's a way we can specify our environment variable and change it without having to actually change our code. Um, OK, so, I mean, literally, that's it. Like one line of code, and now you are using a CDN. So why aren't you doing it? Or you might be, and like, awesome. Good, good for you. Um, the next thing I, that we can do to help this process of help, helping our um, requests go a little bit faster is browser caching. So in general, you're going to hit a web page. It's going to come back. It's going to load on our first request. Our browser is going to like, hopefully store that like, six megabyte image so that on any kind of, any kind of future requests, we don't have to um, come back and say, like, yes, please give me that six megabyte um, image again. It would be the equivalent of flying all the way to Hawaii with all of your bags, and then you go to sleep, and the next morning you wake up and you're back where you came from, and you're like, wait, but I already flew to Hawaii once. Like, you know, why do I have to do that again? Um, so in order to help make this a little bit easier for our browsers, we can set expires headers. Again, you can do this in your config slash production dot RB, and you, you say, hey, these are public images, these are public uh, files, and we want to set it to a really, really far future date. So it's like, hey, please hold on to this image as long as you possibly can. Eventually, like, you know, sure, it's going to be garbage collected if it's not being used. But um, this is just a way, and you say, please hold on to this for a really long time. But what if our file does change? You know, change does happen. We, we want to make the background blue instead of red. Um, so we can turn on something called Rails Asset Fingerprints, which, although it's called Fingerprints, um, we use uh, assets.digest. So you just set that to true. So uh, config production.rb, uh, set config assets.digest to true. And what this is going to do, it's going to take a hash of your file. This is going to be an MD5 sum of, of those assets, and it um, is going to then produce something. If you run it on, say, like headers.css, it's going to produce a string, uh, something kind of like this. This is a fingerprint of your file. So whenever the file changes, the fingerprint does. All right? And what we can do is we can take the file name and the fingerprint, that, that custom string, uh, and join them together to make a custom file name. So this is headers dash, you know, whatever. I'm not going to read all that. Uh, CSS. And if we change anything about our headers.css file, our fingerprint will change. So as far as the browser is concerned, it's a completely different file. Even if it already cached this file, it has never, ever seen headers something, something, something with a different uh, fingerprint. So uh, those are three, like, you know, right there, you, you've enabled your CDN, you set your expires headers, and you've turned on fingerprinting. Um, whoops, there we go. Uh, previously, Rails used to do something kind of similar to this, where it had a, a query string or a query parameter that would set, um, uh, 
be a way to kind of bust the cache. And that wasn't a really standards compliant way of doing that. Uh, apparently, some ISPs would consider that a completely separate request and maybe like not, um, not cache that at, uh, at, at that sort of level. So uh, as you are walking away today, like if anything, please just, if you're like, man, I feel like I saw a talk today, but I can't remember what it was about, um, measure. Like measure everything. Uh, in, in this includes the front end. We can use, there's tools like YSlow, which even if you're not a client side genius, it'll come in here and it'll tell you like, hey, it looks like you're doing these bad things. Don't do them anymore. Uh, guess what? Using, using a CDN is one of them, but that's super easy for us. It'll take like five minutes to sign up for CloudFront, one minute to add that configuration into our server, and then like you're good to go. Um, you can you can be like, hey boss, guess what? I sped up our website by like you know a couple seconds. Like and be like, wow, you know how did you do that? And we're not going to tell them that it was only like one line of code. Um, so compress assets, which we get for free with the um, the asset pipeline. Uh, serve using a CDN. Uh, don't block page parsing. Um, this is eh, if you're interested in this. If you're interested in more um, client side speed, which it really does matter. Um, Ilya Grigorovich uh, has a lot of good content and a couple of good slides. I would recommend uh, looking at his blog. And uh, so, yeah, please measure everything. Scale out with more machines. Uh, speed up your data store or add caching. And of course, when all else fails, MMM ball, Marines, Marauders, Medivacs. Nope. Uh, anybody want to guess what the first M is? Huh? What was that? Uh, I, I heard measure, maybe? All right, OK. Uh, measure, memcache, and more instances. So that's, that's my server MMM ball. Um, again, I work for Heroku. Uh, we do happen to be hiring currently at the moment. If um, you know somebody who might be currently interested in working, um, then you know, maybe come talk to me. Uh, but uh, if anybody has any questions, then shoot. I'll just preemptively say. Uh, my favorite race is Protoss. Uh, my favorite unit is Dark Templar. Uh, yeah, that, that pretty much cuts that up. Thank you very much.